Hey, I'm Joey Logano, and you're watching Cup Connection. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Massaro, and thank you for watching Cup Connection. Believe it or not, race four is already here as the West Coast Swing is winding down with a race in Phoenix this weekend. And so far, the trend is for a new winner every week. That should probably not be surprising considering a year ago, the series saw a record tying 19 different winners. To talk about the way the season has gone so far and shine a light on some of this week's storylines, one of the sport's most knowledgeable, personable, and popular insiders will join us. We're lucky to have Jamie Little here today. But first, what about Vegas? It was a 1-2-3 finish for Hendrick Motorsports, which as an organization dominated the race, leading a combined 241 laps. The guy who outdueled his teammate Kyle Larson for the win was William Byron, who picked up his fifth career win. Joining us now is the winner from last week in Las Vegas, William Byron. First off, congratulations on the win and thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. An, an absolute domination. You swept the stages. You led 176 laps. How would you describe that? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, honestly, to to start the year this early with a, a win like that and in that fashion is a big deal for us. Um, a lot of unknowns coming into the year. You know, how are the Chevys going to be? And um, obviously, so far, so good. It's been really good on the West Coast. So, um, yeah, it's been a, it's been nice to have fast cars. And uh, California, we just didn't quite capitalize. We had some issues there mechanically. But, uh, yeah, just good to get a good good result honestly and then uh and then a win obviously and some drama at the end now obviously you probably had the best car out there i would say you definitely had the best car out there but the way that things played out toward the end your teammate kyle larson was the guy out front and it looked like you'd have a difficult time catching him until the yellow flag flew when when the caution flew there what were your thoughts yeah it was honestly you know it was kyle's race at the end there um you know i thought those guys were going to win and we just didn't quite um have the, a great sequence we lost the lead on pit road and um, you know, got back in traffic and, uh, we were going to finish second. So, uh, still a good day, but, uh, yeah, when the caution came out, I was really excited. So <laughs> I funny, you like, yeah, when you're, when you're in second, you're excited to see a caution. If you're anywhere else, you're kind of, you're kind of like, Oh, whatever. If you're in the lead, you're really bummed. So for me, it was great, uh, good opportunity to you know, come down pit road and do something. So uh, yeah, obviously Kyle was not too happy to see the yellow flag. Um, still terrific day for Hendrick Motorsports. One, two, three finish, and you did it without one of your best drivers, Chase Elliott. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to not have Chase there. I mean, obviously that was you know some a bummer uh, news wise throughout the week, and um, yeah, it just kind of made it for an interesting weekend for us. We kind of had to all pick up the slack, and we knew we'd have good cars at at Vegas, but I think it I think it provided a little bit of extra motivation for for the company just to uh to go out there and put our best effort forward so uh definitely try to pick each other up in those moments have you had a chance to speak with chase yeah for sure we've talked uh, just over text and a little bit over the phone as a group but uh yeah i mean he's in good spirits and um yeah i, I uh can relate I, I snowboard as well so um i was just bummed to hear about it and uh, glad he's doing better. All right. Does the snowboarding continue here while there's still some snow on the mountains or, or did uh, Mr. Hendrick put the kibosh on that? Yeah, I'm not, I don't have any trips planned for the rest of the year, but, uh, got, a, I got my trip out of the way in, in December, went to Telluride in uh, Colorado and had a lot of fun, but yeah, certainly I don't have any trips. So headed back towards the, the East coast after this race. All right. Well, you're in the desert this week. No, no real mountains there. None, none to ski on anyways. Um, sure. So Phoenix, there, there's some X factors this week, right? So a new aerodynamic package. How do you think that's going to impact the race? Yeah, I think the, the race is going to be, you know, it's going to be unpredictable because anytime they change the rules up, uh, you know, nobody has a really good idea of what the balance is going to do, uh, especially throughout the race. So uh, you, you have comers and goers and guys who hit or miss the setup. And so I think, you know, for us, we're just trying to get the most out of the weekend as we can and uh, try to have a good few days before the race just to make sure that we uh, you know, have good qualifying and um, put a good effort in. You know, I know it's only March and it's a little early probably to talk about November, but the championship race is at Phoenix and we know that you're more than likely in the playoffs. So what do you think you need to learn here this weekend that maybe you might be able to carry over to November? Honestly, just get an idea of what the track's going to do throughout the race, you know, make good notes about how the track transitions uh, be detailed with the team. And hopefully we've got a good car 
um, on Sunday just to know what what to do to the car. So uh, we've got to kind of establish a good baseline setup and see see where that puts us. And uh, there's always going to be evolution throughout the year of who's fast, but hopefully we can kind of establish a pretty good setup. Just generally speaking, what do you think of that place? I like it. I've had uh have good had good runs here, but uh want to continue to build on that and get a little bit better. I've I've never had like a outstanding run here, so uh, always been kind of around the top ten. I uh, have a few top tens here, but want to try to get um, over that hump. All right, Chevrolet. They've been dominant this year. They've won all three races so far. Will the streak continue this week? I I, I hope so. I think uh, you know I think there's going to be other strong guys. Pinsky is always really good here, and uh, and JGR. All the all the Toyotas um, have have been good on the short track. So I think you'll see some parity uh, within the top five, especially with the new Arrow package. But uh, yeah, I think we're poised to have another good weekend based on the speed we've shown, and um, that'll certainly carry over somewhat. All right, before I let you go, you made some news this week, uh, a three-race deal with KBM Motorsports to go back to the truck series. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I, I, uh, I'm I, really looking forward to being back in the trucks. Uh, always had good results in the trucks. It's been uh, been fun. That's kind of where I got where, where my name got out there. So looking forward to that and got an Xfinity race as well on a road course. So, uh, yeah, just trying to do as much racing as I can. I've got, I probably have 50 to 52 races this year. So that's wow. a good number. And, uh, yeah, it just keeps me busy. So I like it. Yeah. You're gonna be too busy to do any snowboarding. I would think. <laughs> no, doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Maybe a little golf here and there. All right. That's a little safer. I think Mr. H might appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right, well, William, thank you again. We appreciate your time, and best of luck out there in the Valley of the Sun. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. There's no doubt you will continue to hear much, much more about William Byron. He is certainly among the brightest young talents in the sport, surrounded by a very strong organization. Well, it was International Women's Day earlier this week, and so it seems appropriate to welcome our next guest. She has become one of the most familiar faces during Fox Sports Race broadcasts, a fan favorite, and a groundbreaking broadcaster. Joining me now is the first woman ever to be in the booth doing play-by-play for a nationally televised motorsport event. And I'm proud to say I've known her way back when she was just a pit reporter, you know, Uh, Just making your way up the ranks. My good friend, Jamie Little, is here with us from Fox Sports. Jamie, thanks for being with us. Hi, Mikey. I'm so happy to be with you. And and yes, I haven't forgotten about my pit reporter duties and where it all began. I'm still on pit road on Sundays, but gosh, the memories we have all those years ago. They're tremendous memories. And that's where the the nickname Mikey came from. By the way, folks watching, (laughs) Jamie Little is perhaps the only person I allow to call me Mikey, aside from maybe Shannon Spake, but long story there. (laughs) All right. So, hey, I, I want to get right into it. Uh, you know, it was International Women's Day earlier this week. So uh, it's great to have you here to talk about what you've done as a, as a trailblazer. What does it mean to you to be able to kind of break that glass ceiling and become a play by play person? Well, I think it's very important, Mike. And, and, you know, for me, I've been a reporter. I've covered racing for this is my 22nd year. So for me, these are just the natural progression steps that anybody would take in this role. Um, you know, going from a reporter for X Games and motocross, moving up to IndyCar and then moving up to NASCAR and now in the booth for the truck series and, and the Arkham Menard series. I think that's a natural progression. But I know a lot of people do look at it as you know, trailblazing and well, you're the first to do this and you're the only one to do it in NASCAR. And I take that as a big responsibility because I feel like it's been on my shoulders and in a way, and I've welcomed it to open up those doors for the next generation, for other women out there that say, you know, I wanna be part of racing and I love racing, I know it, I wanna do the booth. And before there wasn't anybody that looked like us that was in the booth to show that it can happen. And, you know, there's a lot of responsibility. There's there's a lot of critique that comes along with being the first. But I think opening up the eyes to everyone, whether it's fans or executives or just other women out there or people, you know, in, in different minorities, you know, I think it's so important across the board to show that it is possible, that if you want to do it, these opportunities are here for you. And another part is just to show producers, you know, those executives at the network levels, that say, well, I, I wasn't willing to ch- take a chance on, you know, a female voice calling the race. Now they see that you can, and maybe you should look at some of these other um, prospects. So to me, that's how I look at it and why I think it's important. It's got to be nice, too. I mean, we, as a pit reporter, 
you know, we spent a lot of time in the rain, in the cold, in the extreme heat. Nice to be in a controlled environment, I would imagine. Well, you know, Mike, because I know you, you know, you did the pre-race show many a times for um, our ESPN coverage. And it's a whole different deal. You know, you're in climate control. Um, you have fancy lights on you to make you look younger. You get your hair and makeup fixed, you know, in between takes. And if it's raining out there, we toss it down to the reporters to do all the front work, you know. <laughs> it's very different. And I appreciate it very much. And, and you know, I respect and admire our pit reporters. You just... When that was you and it still is me, you appreciate that so much and what they're able to add to the broadcast. Yeah, how do you juggle that? I mean, you're a pit reporter and a, a booth play-by-play -play person on the same weekend. How, how do you manage all that? Yeah, like this weekend right now that we're talking about, I'm doing the Arkham and Art Series race in the booth, and then I have Cup Series practicing qualifying and then the Cup race on Sunday. And it is a lot, but to me, Mike, and you know, it's all about your relationships. You have nothing if you don't have relationships in the garage or any sport, on the sidelines, whatever it may be. But NASCAR is a little more in depth where you go up, you can go into any hauler, you can talk to the crew chiefs, talk to the pit crew guys, and talk to drivers. That's where I get my information. And for me, that's the same, whether you're on pit road or you're up in the booth. However, when you're in the booth, you know, you want to set up those stories, but you're not telling all of those stories in a way that you would as a reporter. And by the way, you're talking for two to three hours nonstop in the booth. <laughs> when you're a reporter, it's like, hurry up and get your report in in 15 to 30 seconds. So that's a big difference, too. Yeah. And don't go 31 seconds because you'll hear about it. That, that's <laughs> All right, so I want, to to not that happening, sir. <laughs> I want to get to those relationships here as we we delve into some of the storylines here in Phoenix. I think probably the top storyline is the same top storyline as it was a week ago. We're talking about Chase Elliott. Have you had a chance to speak with him yet? I have not talked to Chase Elliott, but I have talked to Alan Gustafson, his crew chief, many times. From the first moment we found out in Las Vegas, I actually saw Alan first thing in the morning. And, you know, it's a big blow for the team and they're disappointed. But first and foremost, they're worried about Chase. You know, this is a big deal, breaking your leg. Sure, they say he might be out six weeks. You don't really know. Every person is different. Um, will he come back? Absolutely. I think we'll see him back in a couple of months. But what does that mean for the team and adjusting seats and, and what the car has in it, the setups? Are they going to be the same? We're putting a driver like Josh Berry in who has such limited cup experience. He was just in the cup card, this new one, for the very first time. So there's so many adjustments. And, you know, you saw Hendrick Motorsports at Las Vegas. They finished one, two, three. And then yep. Josh Berry was, you know, way outside the top 20 because he doesn't have the experience. So there's a lot going on, but he's a five-time most popular driver in NASCAR. And now he's sidelined just because he was out snowboarding like everybody likes to do. Yeah, well, I, I say on two skis, not, not a snowboard. A little, a little crazy for me. <laughs> you but, and me uh, both. <laughs> so, you know, the team only had a couple of, you know, maybe a day to prepare for the race, really a day and a half because they got the notice so late. Uh, with a little extra time to prepare for Phoenix, should we expect different things from the nine team this week? I think that there's a little bit more of a comfort. You know, they found out last Friday evening that Chase was out and they had to put Josh Berry in the car. And that was literally such a whirlwind for Josh. And Josh told me he was sitting in the hotel room Friday night looking at all this data. Imagine being an Xfinity Series driver where you show up to Vegas because you're racing Xfinity. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you're thrust into this world of cup racing. You have all this data to analyze and you haven't even been in the car before. So there's a lot going on, but I feel like this week, knowing Josh and knowing that nine team, Josh was in the shop. He was looking at data. They were probably in the simulator, just getting more comfortable with the way this car feels. So I would expect them certainly to be a little bit better. And we know they're great at Phoenix. Hendrick Motorsports as a whole is great at Phoenix. So I think they'll be a little bit better. But then, you know, in a couple of weeks at Circuit of the Americas, we're going to have a different driver in, yeah. in Jordan Taylor. So there's a lot of adjustments week by week. You talk about Hendrick being great at Phoenix and have been great throughout pretty much the, the entire year. You know who's really good at Phoenix? Kevin Harvick. <laughs> yeah. So when you look at his numbers, I mean, they're just astonishing. Really, they really are. Nine victories there. Any reason to expect that he's not going to be a factor this weekend? Absolutely not. I think I said on another interview earlier this week that I think Kevin Harvick and Kyle Busch are going to be big factors, which is funny. How many years have we been saying this? 
I mean, Kevin Harvick is incredible what he's still able to do after all these years. And you have all these younger drivers out on the track. Um, you know, somebody like Chase Briscoe is really good. So we're watching him as well, because obviously he won this race a year ago. He's a teammate to Kevin Harvick. But I feel like Kevin is kind of at a different level this year. He knows it's his final one. He's going to make it count. And he, I feel like, will not hold back on pushing somebody out, out of the way if it means the difference between finishing second and finishing first, because this is Kevin Harvick and this is his playground at Phoenix. It definitely is his playground. And, and as you mentioned, he's competitive. He wants to go out on top. You know, there's some X factors this weekend. Uh, a new aero package is being introduced this weekend, a smaller spoiler, a little bit less downforce, if you will. How do you think that's going to impact the race? Yeah, I hope that it makes the racing better. I mean, the racing at Phoenix, I feel like, has been really good with this new car last year. But NASCAR is always moving in that direction of what can we do to make the racing better? What can we do to keep these packs closer together? And they tested this package at Phoenix in January, and they found some things that they really liked. You know, some drivers said it's going to make a big difference because it's putting it back in the driver's hands and it's going to be harder to drive. And then there's other drivers that are like, I didn't really feel much of a difference. But you know, Mike, it doesn't matter how much you test, how many cars are on the track, nothing is like race conditions. Right. So these guys won't really know how this is going to impact them until they're in the race on Sunday. But it's this is something to watch because this is a package we're going to see for many, many races this year. Yeah, road courses and, and smaller ovals. Uh, it's going to be interesting. We're going to be paying attention to that. But you mentioned the new car, right? So this is year two with the new car. You go in the haulers, you talk to the crew chiefs every week. Are you sensing that they're a little bit more comfortable this year with it? Yes, certainly. Last year was so much fun because as a reporter, you just throw out those notes from all previous years because right. this car was truly so different. And guys who were running up front were guys that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be running up front with the car, especially the young guys, right? And their you know, lack of experience compared to the veteran drivers. But they were just kicking butt last year because this new car was kind of like an equalizer. And this car, you know, you hear the feedback. It's more like a race car. It looks, it sounds, and it feels like more of a race car. And these teams have their arms around it, certainly more so. But of course, right when they think that they have their notes and they're ready to go back to Phoenix, hey, we've got a new aero package. So um, I think that those, those notes from last year, certainly they can rely on them a little bit for setup. But Mike, it's all about simulation these days. Yeah. It's incredible what simulation does to help these guys set their cars up, but sometimes they completely miss it. Yeah, and those guys spent a lot of time in those simulators, drivers too. Uh, all right, before we let you go, I know time is running out on us here, but I want to get back to you real quick because everybody wants to know, when are we going to see you in a booth for a, a cup race? When's that going Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Well, Mike, you know that Mike Joy has been there forever, and I don't expect him to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, you know, I get that that question a lot, and it's funny. Like, my whole career, I've never, like, okay, this is where I want to be at this point. I've just kind of enjoyed the ride and I work hard at the current job. And then when there's a, an opportunity presented to you, it's kind of like, hmm, maybe I should go for that. You know, I'm next in line for that. But, you know, at this point, Mike, I don't know if they want a play-by-play -play woman at 55 years old up in the cup booth. I don't know. I'm not 55, but I'm assuming by the time no, I get there. I'll probably well, be 55. Your age. We, we, won't, we won't get into your age. We would never do that. I don't know. No, we're not going to. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's all a matter of time, Jamie, to be honest. Uh, you know, I, I know that Mike is a Hall of Famer. Uh, obviously, uh, he deserves to be in that seat as long as he wants to be. But uh, I'm sure to be waiting for you when it's over. So again, well, thank you for being. Absolutely. Thank you for being with us. I know you've got a really busy weekend, so we'll let you go. But uh, we appreciate your time, Jamie. Thanks, Mike. Always good to see you. And I'm so excited for this, that you're doing this show. It's, it's important for race fans, as you know. It's great to be back. It definitely is. Thanks again. All right. Turning our attention now completely to Phoenix. William Byron might once again be the guy to watch. His Vegas win kept Chevrolet perfect on the season. They've won all three races so far. Of course, that can't go on forever, can it? Perhaps this weekend's favorite is a Ford driver, Kevin Harvick. You just heard Jamie Little talk all about him because there simply aren't enough superlatives to talk about Harvick's success on the one-mile track. Not only does he have nine wins there, he hasn't finished outside the top 10 in Phoenix in over 10 years. It's absolutely incredible. That's not to say he's the only driver who could snap the Chevrolet streak. 
Preparing for the new Aero package, there was a testing session held in January in Phoenix, and six drivers participated, including reigning champion Joey Logano and former champion Brad Keselowski. Again, both Ford drivers. Not saying it's an absolute lock, but when you get to test something with so many unknown variables, it certainly can't hurt. Now, the championship race isn't until November, but it is in Phoenix, so this race does raise the curiosity factor. That's all we have for this week. We appreciate you tuning in to Cup Connection. I'm Mike Massaro.